So my son stood up here. I asked him to share a word. You know, Mark, I was kind of like, nah, nah, I don't want to say nothing. I said, you want to share nothing? I don't know. So I said, you going to share something? Yeah, yeah, later, later. And he waited for last. And he came up with this, his five-second Minute Maid word. I want to see if I can do it the just as he did it, as short as he did it. He talked about him being in the Marine. And for those of you who don't know, he didn't just go to the Marines and do four years and come home. He came home, and he doesn't talk about it because he's not both like that. Like some of you don't even know he graduated or he got a degree already in college and didn't even talk about it. He's already went on to the next one and kept moving and never even, he didn't even tell us. One day I said, aren't you, I said, you talking about getting your bachelor's, when you get your associate's? Oh, I got that already. That's just how he is. He don't talk about it. Now he's already going after his master's. He's finishing that up and he's already, ah, yeah, I'm already doing that. So that's how he is. He's just real low-keyed about stuff. He came out a highly decorated sergeant with two meritorious promotions. And if you don't know what that is, look them up. That's, that's a lot to get those promotions. And he had this certificate, one of many, it was a gold certificate from the, from the Marine Corps, and I set it up in my office. Lindsay's father came in, who was an admiral in the Navy, and he saw this award, and he went, whoa. Do you know how hard it is to get that? As young as he is, they don't just give those out like that. That's a serious award he has. And he was blown away by it. Right, I know. <laughs> right. And I said it to him, I said, Mark, he's blown, yeah, I got two of those. And that's just how he said, I got two of those. Right? <laughs> I got two of those. So I said, you know, I love watching his energy to things. So when he stood up here, he said, you know, when I wanted to be a sergeant, he said, I went for, this, for, the, marital, for the board, you know, this meritorious thing, and they picked this other guy, and they didn't pick me, and he said, I was mad. He said, he, said he was cussing, F these Marines, F all of them, I don't even want to be in this, blah, 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 and he went around cussing and running his mouth and having a fit, you, you know, you, Right? Am I telling it wrong? All right, so you want to come and tell a story? I, I tell you, nobody can tell your story like you. So we're going to switch mics and let Markel tell the story the right way. See, I, because I, that story for me bookmarked me. It changed my life. Ariel said it changed his life too. It made such an opinion. So I want him to share the story the correct way. I got public speaking in, high, in college now. I'm already tired of speaking in front of the class. All right. So it was corporal, it wasn't sergeant. Um, corporal is the first leadership position you get promoted to. From a private to lance corporal, you are considered a junior marine. So you pretty much do the grunt work. As a lance corporal, you're the superior to the junior Marines, but you don't have leadership. Once you're a corporal is when you enter into the leadership roles, basically. So in order to, um, to get to those positions, you can either A, wait to get you to like a certain score, and you wait a certain time. And once you reach that score in time, you get promoted, which is usually like two to three years. Or if you are um, selected by your um, command, they'll put you up on what's called a meritorious board and you compete against the top, um, the top people, your top peers in the, on the base and one person is chosen and they're promoted above their time, which is hard to do. So it's, it's you against every top uh, Lance Corporal or whatever the rank is that you're competing for, it's you against the top and the base and they'll pick one person. So my first, um, I was going to get my first meritorious corporal board. My um, NCO, my staff sergeant told me, you're um, squared away, you, your uniform squared away, you take initiative, you look like a good Marine, we want to sign you up to get you on the board. I was like, all right. 
And at that point, I already knew I had it. I was like, yeah, I'm a corporal. I started marching around. I had the sword. I was practicing the sword. All of the stuff that you're supposed to do, that I thought you were supposed to do. Um, I, I went through my knowledge. I knew everything about the Marine Corps from 1776 to 2015. I could recite everything that you needed to recite on the board. I pretty much was a robot. I knew what I had to do to win the board. And right before, one of the perks, one of the biggest perks about being a corporal is you don't share a room. You get your own room finally, you get your own responsibilities, and that's big in the Marine Corps. When you're on a base, you're not trying to share a room with a bunch of nasty Marines. Most of these dudes don't shower, they leave stuff around, so I'm neat. So that was one of my biggest things. I wanted my own room. So my roommate left, so I had a grace period in between when he left and I was supposed to get my new roommate, and during that time is when my board was supposed to happen. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna get my board, I'm not gonna have to get a new roommate because by the time that person comes, I'm gonna be a corporal. Two weeks before the board, a new Marine came and they put him in my room. So my corporal at the time was like, I moved the bed out and everything. It was no bed, it was just one bed. The whole room was set up. I had my, my posters on the wall, it was ready. I already knew I was gonna have my own room. She was like, we gotta bring another bed in. Like, you gotta rearrange the room, you got a, a roommate. I was like, nah, I'm about to pick up. Like, he's gonna have to leave in another month. I'm about to get on the board. She's like, we don't have nowhere to put him. He has to go here. You're still a Lance Corporal. You have to have a roommate. So I flipped out, started cursing her out, cursing him out, threw the stuff out the room, stormed out. She ended up making the bed by herself, a little five foot three Marine. She ended up having to put the bed together because I had an attitude. I left, I stormed out, I left the base or whatever. So obviously I got in trouble. Um, my staff sergeant was like, I heard what happened. Um, we're gonna have to pull a board. You can't, you, you, you're gonna have to wait until another board comes around. But at, at this moment, you're not fit to be a corporal. And I was, I was pissed off and blaming them. Like, this is my, I already had this. I had the room set up. Like, this is on you guys. I already knew what I had. But it took me time to sit there and realize, thinking about it, that I, did what I thought I had to do, but I didn't embody what it took to be a corporal. And that comes with the maturity, that comes with the professionalism, and I didn't have that aspect. And it took me to get into that position to realize if I was to get promoted at that time, I probably would have ended up getting in trouble because I didn't have that, I didn't have the bearing that I needed to, to carry out that role. So by the time the next board came around, instead of marching around and talking the way I was supposed to and playing with the sword and doing all of that stuff, I started carrying myself like a corporal in everything I did. When I was in the office, I took charge. When Marines had a problem, I was the mediator. I carried myself professionally. I carried myself, I had to submit the immaturity and the boastfulness that I had and become that next position that I was trying to be. I had to become the position before I got the position. So long story short, by the time the board came around, nobody was touching me. I already knew nobody was touching me. But going into the board, I seen the Marines in the mirror practicing, and it was like, yo, you nervous? I'm like, nah, I already won. I already beat you. I can tell looking at you that I already beat you. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the questions they ask on the board, one of the last questions that they ask is, why do you think you should be promoted over the rest of the Marines? And of course, most people are like, oh, well, I know how to march, um, I did all of my, mo my MCIs, my scores are good, blah, blah, blah. I already had my answer because I knew what I, what I have been doing over the past time. And I know that's probably one of the reasons I won that first board. And they asked me, why do you think? I told them because unlike them, I'm already a corporal. I'm just competing to put on the rank of a corporal, but I already embody everything that it takes to be a corporal, it's just me Beat winning this board to actually pin on the rank of corporal. And I think because they understood that I already see myself as one, it made it simple for them to pro promote me. I was the number one pick across the board. From then on, every board I did, I was the number one pick. It was no competition between me and anybody else. Amen. And from that moment, I realized that going up, anything you're trying to do, whether it's a promotion, a position, 
um, financially something you're trying to get, you have to act like you already have it before you have it. It's the only way you're going to get it is to embody what it takes for that next position for you to get it, or else you're not going to be prepared to accept what's coming up before you. And that's what I learned, and from that, from that moment on, I, I utilize that and everything I look at in life, and it works. It works to me, for me. You, I mean, you could, you could try your own thing, but for me, that works the most. Embody what you're supposed to be, and whatever's supposed to come will come to you. Amen. I thought Marco was going to preach the whole message. I was ready to sit down. Those of you who caught it this time, you've got a fuller story because he went more into the detail this time than he did last time. Um, the key to, to success in the things of God is embodying it. I believe I'm healed in Jesus' name. And I hear people say that, and they never get healed. So then they flip it. Well, you know, the Lord has a plan. No, 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 no. You, you believe or you don't believe. Don't, don't, don't try to flip it back on God. You don't embody the healing. You don't even study the word that promised that you are healed. You have more fun talking about the ailment than you talk, do talking about the healing. Well, I got this problem and I got that problem and the doctor said this and I got five of these. But I know... In Jesus' name, I'm healed. But, well, you said one thing about Jesus and 75 things about what the doctor said. Guess which one's winning. Hmm? Because you've embodied your ailment. And you're confessing healing. But not from the place of real deliverance. From the place of, as he said, walking around twirling your sword, this is what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. I don't drink and cuss and do that because I'm a Christian. Yeah, but you want to so bad. You're behaving, but you haven't become. So when I share a word, this is the word of the Lord for this year, and I ask you, do you know the word and you don't know it? It's because you didn't embody it. You just got used to hearing a word every year and letting it go by. Now, for those of you who remember the word, do you expect that? Does that word come back to you from time to time? Do you base decisions you make on that word? Yes or no? Yep. See? Because it's before you. Keep the word in front of your eye. Meditate in it day and night. Then shall you prosper and have good success. Then shall you prosper and have good success. People put me aside the time, Pastor, I'll talk to you a minute. Mm -hmm. And I already know for most of them that it's going to be some problem. People don't put me aside and Pastor, I'm standing on this word. This is what I'm believing. Excited about it. Want to know if you have any advice, anything, you know, got a little obstacle, try to come up here and there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm still standing on this because this is what I've received as my own. Satan can't take what you received, but he can take what you heard. The seed that fell on the stony ground got burnt away. The seed that fell on the roadside got taken away. The seed that fell in the good ground produced fruit. How deep in the ground is the seed that you receive? You come here and hear a good word and get excited. Hallelujah. Amen, Pastor. That was a good word. Whew. That was a good word. Okay, and, then, and that's it. You, did you listen to it again this week? Did you go home and at least put it on YouTube or... Now we got free downloads and streams and whatever. Did you? Nah, I didn't do that. So you heard it that one time, yeah. I went over it 50 times or more before I shared it with you. I'm living it. I'm embodying it. And I'm stopping. This wasn't my message for today. And I'm stopping from time to time to make sure I still embody it. 
I stop and check myself. You heard me talk about my three-month checkups. I stop and I check myself and make sure I'm still on the same page with God. I stop and say, God, okay, I started out excited, but let me just check now. Are we still on the same page? Did I move to the left or to the right? Am I still believing, or did I let doubt come in and choke the word out? Scripture said. The sun came out and scorched it. The pressures of the world, the, thing, the, the offenses, the things of the world came in and choked the word out. So when you hear me teaching this word over and over again about being dispassionate, I'll tell you something. I've learned to be very careful about things that offend me. No amen, no nothing on that. I'm learning to be very careful about things that offend me because I'm realizing something. He said, it, the, 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 the pressure of the world came in, in, in offenses and choke the word out. And I picture Satan coming up on you and you just fed on the word and him using offense to kind of like Heimlich maneuver the word right out of you, just push it right back out of you and get you back to function in the way you functioned because you don't embody. If it's yours, Nothing takes it out. It's the way you see. It's the way you think. It's the way you view it. Even if the wind blows the other direction, you go, okay, it's going to sweep around or some kind of way bring me around the back and still bring me there. But this is what I seem to be true and know to be true. The promises of God are yea and amen. But that don't mean that alone. Well, since God said it, whatever God's will is shall be done. Most people die and never get God's will. Are you listening to me? Most Christians die and never see God's will. Don't you know a few? Never see it. Talk it, claim it, name it, write it on the refrigerator, tape the scriptures underneath it, and die without it. Because as my son just said, the behavior is lining up but the heart's not in tune with it. So you hear a word, and it's okay for you to get excited about it and then just dismiss it. It's okay. I may not remember them in order, but I remember all the words for the past five years. I can't help but remember them. I've experienced the fruit of them. You you want to know what the word is now, those of you who slept on it? You see, yeah, right. The, the, understand and see the provision of the Lord. Well, I don't know about you, but I keep seeing it. But I'm looking for it. Hallelujah. I'm expecting it. And, and I've learned, men and women of God, that the provision of God is not, well, he gave me money to pay my rent. That's, that's a small part of it. Don't look at the after effect as the move. You believed in money came for you to pay bills or you got an extra blessing financially. That's not it. That's just the after effect of it. That's not it. That's not the move. That's the fruit of the move. But that's not the move. And we get caught up in the fruit and we miss the move. How many times have you prayed and the ceiling opened up and a bag of money just fell in your living room? Never happened. But we talk about the part when the money came. Do we talk about the process that God brought us through and walked us through and how each piece connected and interconnected that made that happen? Because that's the move of God. In the actual manifestation, let me see if I can explain it to you real simple. Any of you ever planted a seed to see something grow? Plant, flower, fruit, anything? Let me see your hands. Okay. For those of you who have done that, stay with me on this. I'm going to stay real simple with this, but I just, this is where God has me, so I'm going to stay. What did you plant? She planted a tomato. What did you plant? Flower. Like just a regular plant, house plant. Who else? What did you plant, D? 
A what, baby? A bean, a bean. Okay, that's good. Who else plant? What do you plant? What did you plant? Rice? It's interesting. That's a, that's a good. Rice and corn are real interesting. I'll go to that. I won't go there right away, but that's real interesting. Because corn, you take one little kernel, that little kernel off that corn, and you plant it, and it grows up with a stalk, and it is a, like a, the, the, the multiplication of the seed is ridiculous. The multiplication is ridiculous. One ear has that one seed back a hundred times. Whew. See, I pay attention to stuff like that. It has spiritual significance. Now, you're with me on this? Do I have your attention or am I boring you? We good? When you put that seed in, and if you've never planted something, try it. Helps you understand spiritual principles deeply. When you planted that seed, you put it in dirt. You put it down in the dirt where you can't see it anymore, right? Yes? Then you covered it, right? Then what you do? You put some water on it, sat it in the sun, right? Moved it around to make sure everything was good. How many times did you dig the seed back up to see how it was doing? Why not? Huh? Because you do what? Because you kill it if you dig it back up. Ah, you're not catching me yet. Ah, you're not catching me yet. You're not catching me yet, but you will. Once you put it in the ground, you cover it, and then you have to do something called, 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 and, and, no, and, no, somebody said, who said it? Believe, right? You, you're caught, you, come on, it's dirt. You don't know what's going on in there. You're trusting the process is doing what it's supposed to do, even though you don't have any proof that it is. Oh, y'all, 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 y'all better catch what I'm saying today. You understand? You're trusting that that thing is doing what God created it to do, even though you can't see it. And when you show, and somebody walks over and says, what's this part of dirt for? You say, that ain't dirt. That's my tomato. Am I right? Yeah. It's dirt in the pot. <laughs> Ain't no tomato. I can't eat that. That's dirt in the pot. But you say, that's my, that's my plan. I, I, am I reaching you? That's my tomato. That's my, that's, no, I put an apple seed in there. No, that's my, that's my, whatever you planted. The pot could be this big. You're talking about, no, that's my tomato. Are you getting it? And based on that statement, you've, in the sense of what Markel is saying, embodied the truth that what's in this thing of dirt is what you put in it. And you expect it to manifest. Well, it, I don't know. I, I, put a, I put a tomato seed in it, but it may be lemons. Who knows? Did you say that? Nobody, but you'll do it with your faith. Well, I was believing for this, but you know, maybe God don't want that for me. You know, maybe God got a different plan. What did you plant? What did you plant? Well, I'm not really sure. I just grabbed a handful of seeds and just threw it in there. Whatever comes out, comes out. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because different plants got to be treated differently in order for them to grow. So you don't know what you planted. You just took a shotgun blast up into heaven and hope you hit an angel. <laughs> and you want to know why it doesn't work? Well, I was believing, but, you know, I just gave up. Gave up on what? What did you plant? What did you plant? Simple, right, but profound. What did you plant? I've been building this company. I won't go into the details now, but 
for going to six years. July 3rd will make six years that God gave me the vision. Six years. And I stand up here and tell you when things look like it's going good, and then we have a setback and look like it's not going, then it's going, then it's not going, and look like it's moving, and it's not moving. And I haven't changed my position one time. Now, I've changed my position on a lot of things God has called me to. I've backed down a lot of times when pressure got tight and I couldn't see the, the forest before the trees. But not this time. Because God showed me this and he showed me the, 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 the numbers. And I was like, yeah, if it's the last thing I do on this planet, I'll be doing this till I check out. Because the return is too good. <laughs> but I've learned through process of time. When I look at where me and my wife are today, me and my little brother, and, and we talk about these are dreams we had, and now we're living in them. They've manifested. And I ask my wife a question. She met, she met me when we were 14. We started dating each other between 16 and 17. So I was in the hood just like her, broke just like everybody there. You, you understand what I'm saying? I was saving my money to get the latest pair of sneakers. I didn't have no, no cash flow. Old enough where my godparents wasn't giving me money like that anymore. And I had to go get me some of youth jobs just so I can buy the latest pair. You, come on, you know. I asked her the question. And again, I asked her recently, what made you believe? You, you said you always believed that we would have the life that we have. What made you believe that? Now, you got to understand this. This is coming from somebody at the time who, who wasn't Christian. I wasn't Christian, but she said these words to me. Are you listening? You listening? You listening? And when I say this, you're going to bear witness with this Why you're with him. She said, because nobody I knew talked like you do. She said, I didn't know anybody who talked. Right, we grew up in the hood. Everybody was trying to, if they could get out of school and then get a good job or get at the, at, work for sanitation at the token booth, that was a dream. Maybe get a number spot. You know, that was the dream. And I was talking about owning houses and having my own recording studio and all this stuff when I was 17, 18 years old. I didn't think about it, but she did. She said, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm latching on to this. <laughs> he going somewhere, I'm, I'm on this ride. Because when she said to me, nobody I know talked like you do. Even as a young girl, she knew or sensed something in her spirit like, he keep talking like that. Something going to happen. No, you're not catching what I'm saying. You're not catching what I'm saying. At 16, 17 years old, she made a connection that I hadn't even made. I didn't know nothing about the Bible or Jesus. She made a connection then that if this boy keep talking like this, life going to be real good with him. Let me say it one more time. As a child, she made the connection, if he keeps talking like this, let me, let me say it one more time. She said, if he keeps talking like this, you're starting to get it? At 16, 17 years old, she figured out, if he keeps talking like this, some things are going to happen, and I'm going to be there when they do. Hold up. She had a sense enough to know I don't even have to do the talking. I'm just going to hang with him while he's talking. Do you understand what I'm saying? If he keeps talking like this, what she was saying is what my son is saying now as a grown man. He embodies what he believes even as a kid. 
He talks crap. I got on people's nerves, I talked big. I got on my family's nerves, I talked big. I talked big. I had big dreams. I had these great expectations. I know I'm supposed to do something great in this life. I didn't know what the heck it was, but I knew it was supposed to be something big. So I latched on to the only thing I knew, which was music, and thought maybe that was going to be the way. But still, one thing went belly up, I started talking about the next thing. One thing didn't manifest, I started talking about the next thing. And I stayed consistent to that. Maybe that was a gift in my life that I didn't even understand. But I know that one thing, it was real enough, she understood it. And when I say to her today, we have the things that I decided would make me complete and satisfied back then, I've surpassed it three or four times. Because whenever I achieve one thing, I start talking the next thing. Sometimes now I talk two or three things at one time. Are you listening to me? I thought you would get a little more excited. You're just sitting there looking at me like you're dumb. Do you get what I'm saying here today? What are you saying? When people listen to you talk, what comes out of your mouth? Well, I know God is able. So what? You ain't saying nothing deep. Well, God is good all the time. You still ain't saying nothing. God know what he is. He don't need you to speak for him. What are you saying about you? God knows he's good. All praise to the Lord. The Lord, I'm saying, I'm, I'm good. Definitely don't need yours. Ah, I offended somebody. I don't need your little sucky praise. Well, you know the Lord, you know, it's all praise to God, you know, whatever. He, God, like that ain't no praise. That's just you making excuses and then wrapping some Christian sayings around it. Praise comes from real manifestation. Amen. If you're really praising them, then there should be some fruit. Amen. Well, I, I just believe I just get through every day by the grace of God. So the devils and regular people that don't know Jesus. You just said nothing. You have no example that they would look at and say, I want what you got. And I ain't talking about stuff. I'm talking about just you, when you pray, heavens move. When you speak, things happen. So when the people now speak to me, and like I said, I'm not even going to go into the levels of what's going on because you're not even ready for it. But, but, but when people speak now and say, you know, you've been saying, you said that six years ago. Before they would tell me, you don't know what you're doing, you're crazy. Now they're saying, everything you've been, what else you got to say? Because everything you said back then is manifesting. So what's, what's going to happen in the next five years? I want to know what you got to say. And even if they don't say what God say to you, that's what they're saying. You were saying this was the way to go when we didn't even know that that even existed. And now it's the big thing and everybody's trying to do it and you're ahead of the curve. And we want to know what else you got. What else you heard? And I stand in front of you and give you the word of the year and say, this is what God is saying to you. And you go, amen, hallelujah. You remember what God said? No. No. I don't. But it's supposed to manifest because I said it? Yeah, for me. <laughs> for me, not for you. For me and those who receive it. So I'm going to wrap this mess up a little early today, and I'm going to say this. It's totally useless for me to keep giving you a word that you're not going to plant. It's totally useless for me to keep sharing with you a truth that you're not going to embody. It's useless. It's useless. The church, I say it all the time, church people get on my nerves, can't stand church folk, because church folk just sit in church. You know what I mean by church folk? Church folk that's only good in church. 
outside of the four walls of the church, they're useless to the world and anybody around. They're useless even to their own family as Christians. Their own family can't even say, yo, having this one, I'm blessed to have you in my family. You make a difference in my life. Your own kids are not even blessed to have you as a parent. Messed up. Messed up. Messed up. My kids don't always agree with me, but my kids will tell you, son, are you blessed to have me as a father? Because I'm leaving him a legacy. And don't get caught up in the money stuff. The way he stood up here and talked, that's legacy. That's what he's seen. That's what he grew up with. He knows how to pray. He knows in the city, whether he chooses to all the time or not is up to him. But he knows. He knows. For him to say, he, so he left that part out of the story. He spoke to God and God said to him, you don't embody it. You're just behaving like it. He left that part out of the story. He said it the first time. He said he went back in the room. He was fuming and God spoke to him and said, you don't embody it. You're just behaving like it. So when he went back the next time, he said, I got this. I'm watching the guys in the mirror going, yeah, they're doing that junk I used to do when I didn't have it. Yeah, we got it. We got it. You ain't get nothing. Except the thrill you get in the jumping around, waving your hands in the air and crying. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right. Nothing. Nothing. Whatever emotional rush you got out of that moment, enjoy it. That's all you getting. Because when I ask you after I pre preached that great message that you said, oh, moved you so much, after you cried and rolled around in the floor, and I say to you, so what did you receive from the Lord? I don't know, Pastor. I just, just believe that all things work. Right? Because that's what it means to me. That's right here. It'll mean nothing. Nothing. You can't affirmatively tell me what God has showed you he's going to do with, for, and through you. You get nothing. Nothing. Talking good game, quoting great scriptures, and then can't affirm one word that God has assured you of in your life. One word. I don't know why God ain't ready. Because you're not ready. God ain't, God don't have to get ready. I never walked in the court God undressed. God's always ready. Are you feeling the, the, what I'm saying today? I'm, I'm, I'm shouting out a cry of desperation. Stop running around talking about Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus and the other, and you are not embodying anything about the kingdom. You haven't made a definite declaration about anything. Except for I'm saved. And you'll make that declaration sure, don't you? Look at your pot. Look at your, your, your pot of dirt and say, this is my apple tree. All I see is dirt. I didn't ask you what you saw. I just told you what it was. Amen. How do you know that? Because I know what I planted. I know what I put in the pot. The spiritual kingdom works like a pot. Good soil. You speak the word in it, and no matter what the situation say, that's what it is. Why? Because I sought the Lord, and he gave me that seed. I planted the seed God gave me. Pastor, I'm trying. I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so tired of people coming to me saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. And want me to tell you what you're supposed to do. Seriously? 
I'm supposed to get your word and give it to you? And I try, and you still don't get it. And it's something I learned about people. If they ain't receiving it from God, even if you give it to them straight from God, they're still not going to receive it. They're still not going to do it. They're still not going to follow through with it. They'll get excited. How do pastor? I needed to hear that. Oh, amen. Holly, thank you so much, pastor. See, that's why I love you, pastor. You always can hear from the Lord. Why can't you? Thank you for telling me that, and I agree with you. I can, and that's why I get results. So I'm going to ask you to do something today. Speak something. And then when you say it, and you know you don't believe it, then go before the throne with it until you say it and you believe it. Amen. Well, I started that way, and it didn't seem like it was going the right way. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means for most people, so I'm giving up on that. I'm going to let that go. Did God tell you to let it go? No. But maybe God don't. Now you, now you went from definites to maybes. When we first started this conversation, you knew what God was saying. Now it's maybe. How quickly that changed, huh? Say something. Right now, bow your head and say something that you know God has put on your heart that you should be saying and need to be saying. Speak some life over yourself right now. Speak something positive and strong about what God is doing with you in this season of your life. Bring back a dream that you let the devil bury and speak it out. Say something. Put it out there. And after you put it out there, make a decision that if you die, you still won't move. If it goes all right next week or it looks like it's going totally wrong, you won't change your position. If you don't know what to speak, say, Lord, what is it I need to be speaking? What is it that, I mean, and don't you have to start big? Let me just help some of you out. Don't say, okay, I'm just believing I'm going to be a millionaire. Look, you don't even have $1,000. Just can, can you start with something? I won't tell you the whole Metro card story again, but I started with a Metro card that God kept miraculously charging every week. But I started somewhere. I had Metro car faith. And that was already after I was making good money in the computer field, so I really I had faith before that, but I wanted to see something beyond the natural. So I started where I could start. I understand surplus. I understand surplus that you can't count in your hand. Look around the room. Look around. You see how many people in here? How do we own a building? And pay for it every month. And just ask yourself a question. How much do you put in there? Because <laughs> those of you who ain't putting nothing in, you know. You know. <laughs> and I guarantee you it's a good, strong majority. It ain't tied in 10%. Guarantee you. And even if you were, this ain't enough people to pay for a building. Even if all they were doing 20%, it ain't enough to pay for a building. How do we do it? How do we do it? We ain't living up with Jeff. Jeff don't pay rent. <laughs> How are we doing this? I know the principles work. Amen. I know they work. I know they work. I know they work. And I can't walk in my bank account tomorrow and just pull out $300,000 and lay it in the middle of the living room floor. It is not there. But I know when I go to that pitcher and pour, some more oil is going to come out. It may look empty when I look at the thing, but I said, well, yeah, but when I need to go in there and take out what I need to take out, it's going to be in there. 
It'll come from somewhere. It'll show up some kind of way. God, whatever needs to happen, if a bird got to fly in and drop it out of his beak, it'll work. I know it will. All I got to do is set my face toward it and, and know that I'm in God's will and I know it will happen. And we see, but that's how I talk. But that's how I talk. I expect provision. We put so much money in the prospect and then had to leave the building. And when God finally brought this building to us, I was like, oh my goodness, but we put all this money close to 70 to 60,000, whatever, into prospect. Now you're moving us over here. And then we moved here, and then God started telling us to give money to people. Give this one $3,000. Give this one $5,000. $5,000? God, did you see the bank account? <laughs> so yeah, I saw it. It ain't enough to do what you need to do, is it? No, give it away. And we did. And all of a sudden, stuff starts showing up. It works. I expect it to. Amen?